All right, everyone, thank you for joining our session. Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Bolton, and I am a member of the class of 2022 at Columbia Business School. I'm also a co-marketing president, a cluster chair for G22, a peer advisor, a career management center fellow, and a SOFIN board member. So I do a lot of things, but it's because I love to give back to this community here at Columbia. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today for the following session. It's a fireside chat with Dr. Sheena Ayangar and Shia Mustafa. Just to give you a little brief background on them, Sheena Ayangar is a world expert on choice and decision making. Her book, The Art of Choosing, received the Financial Times and Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award and was ranked number three on Amazon.com Best Business and Investing Books. Her research is regularly cited in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, as well as in popular books, such as Malcolm Gladwell's Blink and Aziz Ansari's Modern Romance. Additionally, she has her own book coming out later this year, Think Bigger. And Dr. Ayanga has also appeared on television, including The Today Show, The Daily Show, and Farid Zakari's GPS on CNN. Her TED Talks have collectively received almost four million views, and her research continues to inform markets, businesses, and individuals around the world. Shia Mustafa is the co-founder and co-CEO of Correlation One, an education technology company that helps countries and enterprises upskill and develop their talent for the jobs of the future. Correlation One has pioneered a new educational model which is 100% employer funded and free for learners, working with customers like Amazon, SoftBank, Citadel, Morgan Stanley, Walmart, Johnson & Johnson, Root Insurance, Ally, Match Group, and more. Correlation One also provides free year-round training and mentorship to thousands of students and professionals from underrepresented groups and connects them with jobs. Sham holds an MBA and MPH from Columbia University and a BA and LLB from the University of Madras, India. So that gives you a brief background on our panelists for today. I'm sure you'll learn so much more from them in a, a few minutes. You'll be able to ask questions toward the end of the session. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Yangar and Sham. This is a real treat today to be here with Sham. I still remember the day, I think it was sometime in the fall of 2011. I was sitting in Silver Moon, uh, for those of you alums probably know where Silver Moon is. Um, I was having coffee and this guy shows up. I was chatting with somebody who used to play squash with and uh, I met this guy and he was telling me all about the kinds of stuff he used to do in Harlem, helping different businesses. And then little by little, I began to learn about his own background. Um, eventually, over time, he ended up applying to the Columbia Business School. I actually encouraged him to do that because I think at the time he wasn't thinking about doing an MBA at all. And here we are, years later, after he's not only graduated from CBS, but he has a company that's trying to change our world, and he gets to be right up in the front of the room to tell you all about it in our brand new institution. So I really want to take this moment to first congratulate Sham for all the achievements he's made. So thank you. Thank you, Shina. So let's start by first asking you, Sham. Um, so you, you started Correlation One, and Correlation One very much tries to address the problem confronting the lack of women and minorities um, in the, the digital um, tech space and computing. So I was wondering if you could tell us what are some main statistics about, you know, why should we care about this problem? Absolutely. Sheena, thank you, and it's, it's always uh, it's a pleasure to come back to CBS. It's an honor to uh, share the stage with you. Um, today, as, as we're thinking about the future, um, uh, there's some, some core statistics which we'll actually uh, talk about later on in the presentation. Uh, women are, are, when it comes to technology jobs, uh, hold only around 27% of those jobs. Uh, when it comes to jobs of the future, which we broadly cl classify as jobs in AI, data science, cyber, uh, cloud computing, and other di digital skills, uh, uh, this is in single digits, uh, under 9%. Our own uh, data actually shows us uh, uh, that this is, this is an important issue. And the reason we should care about this is because uh, the w we are very much in the data and AI economy today. Uh, we have all heard, um, horror stories about 
facial recognition algorithms not recognizing colored faces, loan provisioning algorithms disproportionately denying loans to certain demographics. Uh, this is all a reflection of lack of diversity, uh, lack of representation uh, when it comes to the people who build the algorithms. More and more of our decision making, our life is revolving around the algorithms that tech firms are building. So uh, it's an important issue. We need to address it today, and the time for action is now. That's why we should care. Mm. You know, one of the things that really struck me about you when I first met you years ago was your background. And I was wondering if you could share with the audience a little bit about your background and how you've come to care about this particular problem. Absolutely. Um, uh, I grew up in India. I was the youngest of uh, eight kids. Um, we, we grew up in, in a, including four sisters. Uh, we grew up in a one bedroom uh, apartment. Uh, my dad um, supported our, our young family. He ran a small store selling used electronic goods. The store was about uh, uh, four, uh, four, uh, four feet by four feet, around like 16 square, uh, uh, square foot, just enough for one person to actually stand in and uh, you know, sell his goods. Um, uh, he could never attend school. Um, he started working when he was 10. He was the breadwinner of his family. And so he never had the chance to get an education. Uh, that didn't stop him from dreaming big for us. He believed that uh, our, our ticket out of that world was education. And so, uh, um, and incidentally, uh, I also got my professional career started at the same store uh, where I used to sell used cell phones starting uh, when I was 17. Eventually graduated to uh, selling used cars. Uh, but basically, that's how, that's how I, I, I got started. Now, um, as um, creating opportunities for others, I've always had in intrinsic motivation for doing that uh, because uh, this is all, you know, um, I've experienced ev uh, these, uh, I've been an immigrant, I've been a first generation college grad, I've been a minority, and uh, the journey is different. It's more challenging, and so uh, I've always been motivated to finding scalable solutions to create to creating opportunities for others. So you went from starting to sell phones to cars, and then, if I recall, you also did stuff in Harlem because you used to tell me all these stories about all these businesses that you used to help get off the ground in Harlem or help give them funding. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll just like, you know, quickly rewind it and so I could connect the pieces. Uh, uh, right, I, in, in India, I went to law school. I practiced criminal defense for a few years. I, I decided that it was not for me. Uh, decided to switch careers, so I came to Columbia in uh, 2004. I actually went to SEPA for my MPA first. Right after I graduated from SEPA, uh, I took a job uh, in Harlem. Uh, this is a program that's funded by U.S. Department of Commerce to support workforce development and entrepreneurship in Harlem. And uh, the reason the funding came from U.S. Department of Commerce was in economically underrepresented uh, communities like Harlem, small businesses created over 90% of jobs there. Uh, but those, uh, uh, those businesses typically you know, faced a suite of challenges. And, uh, you know, so uh, Department of Commerce created the program to help support entrepreneurs and, in return, jobs that they create in local communities. And uh, postgraduate school, post uh, uh, um, SEPA, it was a very attractive proposition because it's a problem that's near and dear to my heart. It's also, uh, as, as um, someone who's looking to make an impact, it gave me an amazing platform. So I took up that job. Uh, I did that for five years. Uh, I worked with hundreds of businesses uh, across, across Harlem. Uh, and uh, eventually, the program expanded to other underserved communities in, in uh, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and other, other areas. Now, um, what was actually um, incredible about that experience was um, uh, when I was at Columbia as a graduate student, I met some incredibly smart, uh, talented people. Uh, now, when I was in Harlem doing my uh, uh, job, 
I met some incredibly smart, talented, probably uh, uh, even more capable because the grittier and uh, uh, people. So uh, I saw no difference in skills, potential. Uh, the only thing that was really starkly different was the opportunity set in front of people. Uh, you know, we're here today. If we just go uh, um, about four or five blocks east, the opportunities that uh, are in front of people are night and day. So um, um, that's basically, you know, uh, uh, af af after that job, um, I always, I, I wanted to start a business that's focused on uh, unlocking human potential. And uh, that's actually around the time when, when I met you. So you were at CBS. Tell us how you got this idea. Yeah, no, but before, before I get to, I even got to CBS, I, I, I wasn't sure if uh, I needed to go to CBS. Uh, you know, um, uh, what, I, what I recognized at that time was to actually uh, start an enterprise, start a business, uh, you know, I needed, uh, I needed new skills, I needed new networks, I needed uh, uh, a dose of courage, which I didn't have to go and uh, start my business at that time. And uh, Shina, as you mentioned, I, I ran into you July of like 2011 at uh, Silver Moon Cafe. Um, he actually remembers, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, um, you know, the, the, the con like uh, when I met you, I had already read your book, uh, The Art of Choosing, and so I was starstruck. The book had a profound impact on me. You know, after I read the book, I, I, I learned that I need to be choosy about choosing. Uh, I need to make better decisions. And so um, uh, that was the conversations with you, the potential, the opportunity to learn from you, to be mentored by you was, was definitely a very important factor when I decided to attend CBS. Um, and um, my two years at CBS was also uh, the most profound professional and personal development journey for me. Uh, I could not have seen it at that time, but uh, when I eventually started the company, we have raised three rounds of capital for Coalition One. Uh, from my seed uh, round to uh, uh, the, the entity which led our Series A, as well as uh, the other bridge round that we raised, they all were people I met through my CBS network. Not only that, uh, people who eventually would become my clients, uh, advisors who opened up their networks, and uh, so incredibly grateful for the opportunities that CBS has created for me. Um, now, to go back to your question, um, the, uh, the, the, the idea for correlation, well, I distinctly remember when that happened. So, um, I, I took entrepreneurial finance class uh, as a block week taught by uh, uh, Dean Glenn Hubbard. Now, uh, it, was, it, was an, it was an intense block week. Uh, I had a take home assignment, which I completed at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, 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 I, was, I was sitting at Warren Hall. Then I was walking back home. Suddenly, you know, it's sort of like I knew I wanted to start a business that, that's focused on uh, human capital. I also, I was passionate about education given my background. I also was frustrated by, by what I saw uh, are inequities, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, from my work in Harlem. Suddenly as I was walking home 4 a.m., I started putting the pieces together. I decided I was ready, uh, um, um, really. And it's sort of like, you know, um, Start, starting a business, deciding to uh, start an enterprise is one of the most consequential decisions that one can make. Uh, it, it obviously puts your financial, psychological, and emotional health at risk uh, with no guarantees of success. In fact, like pretty high probability of failure. And so everyone has to go through that journey to, uh, to, to gain courage, uh, you know, through my from my experience, although I came in with, with, the, with the goal of starting, starting my uh, business, uh, the, the journey um, and, and the people I met gave me, gave me the conviction that I was ready. Very cool. So what is Correlation One? Excellent question. <laughs> um, so 
Uh, today, every enterprise in the world, whether it's Amazon or Morgan Stanley or Johnson & Johnson, is, is going through a phase of transition. Um, the, this is tied to, so we are squarely in the data and AI economy. Now, there, is, uh, there, are, there, there are a couple of uh, huge trends. Now, one is there's an absolute talent shortage when it comes to um, what we call the jobs of tomorrow. These are the jobs in AI, AR, uh, cybersecurity, data science, cloud computing. Now, the world just does not have the talent, uh, the skills that's necessary uh, to compete in the new world. And so uh, large enterprises are scrambling to, one, find this talent, and two, upskill and reskill their workforces. Uh, you know, there's very credible studies by McKinsey show that hundreds of millions of people need to upskill, they need to be data fluent, and uh, need a whole range of other skills to, it's not just a nice to have, uh, you know, to compete in this economy, you need to go through this transition. So this is happening right now as we speak. Uh, Correlation One helps companies to prepare their workforces for these jobs of the future. We're a net tech company. Uh, we go into companies and we train their uh, people to, for the skills that they need. And uh, we also help companies build diverse talent pipelines. That's what we do. So give me an example. You, you help train people that some company gives you and you prepare them. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm actually going to give you three examples. Perfect. There are three examples. These might actually seem like very different use cases. Uh, all connect the pieces in the end. Um, um, Use case number one, SoftBank uh, is one of Correlation One's uh, long-standing clients. As we all know, SoftBank's Vision Fund is the largest uh, venture capital fund in the world. It's a $100 billion uh, venture capital fund. Uh, the core hypothesis, investment hypothesis, thesis for uh, the Vision Fund is to unlock the power of AI. Now, uh, SoftBank basically wanted to make sure that their portfolio companies have the most sophisticated advanced uh, AI skills. And um, for these skills, um, uh, and, and the goal there is to enable data science across the portfolio and to find opportunities before anyone else in the market could, uh, could do it. And so uh, after a global search, they engaged Correlation One. Uh, they had launched um, a $5 billion fund in LATAM to focus on Latin American companies. So uh, basically SoftBank pooled around like 250 odd employees of their portfolio companies. Uh, these are engineers, product managers, and uh, business development associates. Uh, we ran an advanced machine learning curriculum uh, that trained uh, these uh, uh, SoftBank portfolio company employees on the most uh, uh, impactful use cases of machine learning. To give you an example, what this means is um, we trained, uh, you know, uh, one of the companies that we trained as part of SoftBank's portfolio was a Brazilian logistics firm called Logi. It's a unicorn where uh, that firm sent uh, around 20 employees. Uh, and um, part of our, our, our training and education focuses on real life applied AI skills. Uh, you know, so what we do is, um, um, uh, as part of the training, we use data sets from those companies. Uh, you know, people actually build tools. Uh, and our goal is simple. Whatever you learn today, you should be able to apply it in your job tomorrow. And uh, one of those companies, uh, one of the teams from Logi created a new routing algorithm that saved that firm $17 million a year. So that's sort of like the education uh, that we provide, so that's use case number one, that's SoftBank. Um, use so they gave you the funds to train their employees that they already had? Yes, that's basically the business model. Firms have budgets to upskill, and they're, they're big budgets, like firms invest hundreds of millions of dollars, firms like Amazon actually you know, have multi-billion dollars of investment dedicated for this purpose. So that's basically how uh, these programs get funded. Um, another very different use case is Amazon. Amazon is actually one of our largest uh, customers. Now, Amazon has, has a goal. Um, 
They want every single employee in Amazon, whether you're a warehouse worker, a call center worker, a retail worker, uh, uh, to be data fluent. And so Amazon actually pays for, uh, we, we're currently, we actually train thousands of people every year for Amazon, where um, uh, uh, this is to prepare the workforce for basic data fluency. And the goal there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amazon benefits by having a, a data literate workforce. People benefit by getting better opportunities inside or outside Amazon. And uh, so we're currently right now training, you know, uh, thousands of Amazon's factory retail call center workers on basic data literacy. So that's use case number two. And the third, which is again, a completely different use case is um, one of our longest standing clients for the last six years, we have been helping Citadel, one of the largest uh, uh, hedge funds in the world, multi-strategy hedge, uh, hedge fund, one of the most successful hedge funds, where um, Citadel came to us about six years ago, where the other problems I mentioned, we don't just focus on upskilling and reskilling, we also help companies build talent pipelines. Citadel came to us with a, with, a, with a goal. They wanted to hire the best talent, no matter where they are in the world. They wanted to build a giant pipeline of like tens of thousands of workers, benchmark them, and uh, uh, nurture them into eventual opportunities at Citadel. And so we came up with uh, a completely uh, new talent strategy for Citadel, where uh, um, what we did, rather than a traditional recruiting process where you go through interviews, you do a whiteboard uh, exercise, we came up with uh, um, a recruiting strategy which revolved around competitions. The goal is to simulate what people actually do in their jobs through competitions, make it fun and engaging, while getting the recruiting signals on who's really good, uh, rather than use interviews, which is, uh, as we all know, is a control setting, and uh, uh, automate that process like, and uh, so since we started doing this for Citadel, we run about 20 data science competitions for them all over the world every year. We've ran over 120 competitions for them by this point. And uh, uh, um, a significant percentage of Citadel's incoming quantitative research, data science, software engineering, machine learning talent comes through the competitions we organize. In fact, our approach was uh, considered to be revolutionary. Uh, our friends at Harvard Business School wrote a case study about, about this. This is, uh, they call this Recruiting 2.0, the future of recruiting. And uh, the case is actually being taught at HBS um, as we speak today. So um, now, what I wanted, I, I promised that I'll tie the pieces back together. It seem, this might seem like different clients, different set of problems, but ultimately, what matters here is uh, every company, they all want this talent. Uh, firms are you know, spending hundreds of millions, millions of dollars every year trying to find the talent or uh, trying to grow the talent that they already have. And so that's basically, uh, we help firms uh, go through that transition. So that's what we do. So you started earlier by talking about a desire to try to move the needle on helping place women and minorities in more data literacy jobs or data fluency jobs. How does what you do help with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me actually, I want to share a few slides to, to uh, set, the, uh, set the context for the audience here. Um, let's see, let's start with generally women in workplace today. As, as uh, you know, this is, this is a chart. Uh, basically, uh, women start almost on, on parity, right? There are around 47% of the jobs uh, in the economy go to women. But those jobs steadily decline at every, uh, uh, as, at every level of uh, advancement, right? Uh, to a point when it comes to leadership roles, uh, it's all, it's just half uh, of, uh, like not even, I'm sorry, like about 27% of the leaders today are, are, are women. Uh, so this is, this is broad, this is any job, not just in technology. Uh, so there have been small gains in the pipeline uh, over the last five years, 
uh, around 2% at the entry level and uh, around 5% at the leadership level. But um, um, it's, it's, it's a very uneven world. Now, when it comes to technology, that's, that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, uh, this is when it comes to jobs in computing or engineering. Uh, in computing, for instance, today, we actually have less women, around 7% less women in computing than 30 years ago. In 1990, there were 32%. Today, there are only 25% women in computing. In engineering jobs, uh, you know, there's, there's a marginal improvement, uh, but uh, in anything that's computing related, uh, uh, there's a pretty significant decline. There, there is, uh, the next point I wanted to touch was around wage disparity. Across the board, across all racial and ethnic groups, women in STEM earn less than their male counterparts. Uh, you know, like, I think most, most, most folks here would intu intuitively know the, those statistics. Uh, you know, so I have a chart here which, which actually shows uh, the, the level of disparity here. Uh, I'm not wearing my glasses, so I can't call out the exact numbers here, but uh, the chart uh, is, is pretty obvious. What's particularly noteworthy here um, are, um, is the wage disparity for black and Hispanic women. Uh, they earn the lowest for exactly the same job relative to a white or an Asian male. Um, moving on, uh, there's also, uh, this is the state of uh, women of color in STEM today. Now, in this chart, as we can see, uh, women of color lose ground on every single step. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the entry level roles, uh, it starts around 17% around of uh, those jobs uh, go to women of color. But when it comes to leadership roles, uh, this goes down to 4%. So um, this is, um, Sheena, did you have a question? Keep going. Okay. okay. Uh, so this is, this is basically uh, the, the state of things today. Now, um, uh, what these, these, these statistics, obviously, you know, uh, uh, outside, outside uh, the statistics that I actually showed today, um, correlation one, we also have our own proprietary data sets. Uh, we, through our assessment platform, uh, you know, anytime we train someone, when we go into a company, we use a benchmarking exercise to uh, see where the town base of a company is relative to the broader market. So we have actually assessed hundreds of thousands of people over the last uh, six years. Now, when we looked at our own data, uh, the, the numbers were actually even scarier, uh, when, especially when it comes to carriers and uh, data and analytics. It was in single digits for women in general. It's uh, uh, low single digits, very low single digits, around 2% of the town going in are women of color. So um, we care about not just uh, building a financially successful company, we deeply care about building a company that create equal access to jobs of tomorrow. So we started investigating the problem. What, what are the root causes? Why uh, clearly we all read the news, every CEO wants to hire more women, uh, female talent, every CEO wants to hire more diverse talent, and um, lots of tech companies have been spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to diversify the technical workforce, but yet there's been no progress. So uh, we went and studied the problem. We had hundreds and hundreds of conversations with stakeholders, with networks, people who are closer to this community. And basically, it came down to three reasons, uh, three barriers, if you will. Uh, uh, and there, there, there are many, many reasons, but uh, three core barriers. Number one, uh, cost. Cost is a barrier. Uh, to acquire these skills, uh, uh, especially if you're in workforce today, is expensive. Uh, your, uh, your options, um, you know, obviously if you're at CBS, you already have the best possible education in the world, but this is, um, you know, at CBS we are still in a, it's a small bubble, right? It's not representative of the real world. And so when it comes to people who are in workforce today, 
you practically have no options. You have to put your life on hold, uh, go and acquire a new skill, spend uh, you know uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars. That is just not an option if you're the primary breadwinner of your family. Uh, um, so that's cost is a barrier to acquiring these skills of the future. Number two, communities of color, women, uh, the second barrier, what we recognized, what people told us, was there's a mentorship gap. Um, now, what we mean by that is, um, um, let's say, uh, and just, just to give you an example, just to bring this to light, we spoke to a few uh, women of color who were at a very large tech company, Stanford PhD in computer science. What we expected to hear was um, the journey was, uh, uh, journey was a difficult one, but I made it, I'm here. We actually heard the opposite. The journey was difficult, I made it, and I'm alone, and I don't get any support. And so uh, broadly across like, you know, this, this came out as like the second strongest indicator that we lack mentors, that, that, that seems to be one of the barrier across the board. And the third barrier is, is more complex and more difficult. We call it um, the social capital gap. What we mean by this is, um, you know, uh, as, as we all know, uh, when you go to CBS or when you go to other, other comparable institutions, uh, you know, it helps you get, it, get your foot at the door, right? Most opportunities come from your second and third degree networks. When you come from historically underrepresented communities, even if you have the skills, you don't have access to these networks. Uh, and uh, so that is a challenge that came up routinely. So these were the biggest barriers that, uh, you know, these were the root causes. And unless we address the root causes, uh, the representation of women that we saw will keep going down. The representation of um, people of color will keep going down. Eric? Um, five minute warning, so we'll start Q&A in five minutes. So folks mm -hmm. in the audience, please get your questions ready. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So if you're trying to address such an important problem, but also run a business, uh, how do you make a profit to, you know, keep the lights on, and how do you sustain this model? Excellent question. So, um, so Correlation One operates at the intersection of three megatrends. Um, megatrend number one: uh, the world is going through this upskilling, reskilling journey. Hundreds of millions of people need to upskill. That's that's one that's happening today. Number two. Uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, finally, companies are putting real uh, efforts and tying it to compensation. Just last week, or two weeks ago, Salesforce joined a growing number of companies which tied uh, executive compensation to, uh, to recruiting and retaining diverse talent. Uh, there are not enough scalable solutions in the world for companies uh, doing that. And third, uh, there is a war for talent when it comes to data analytics, cybersecurity skills of the future. So we play at the intersection of these three megatrends. We're an ed tech company solving these mission critical problems for, for firms. And just to give you a sense of uh, scale here, Amazon committed $1.2 billion uh, for the next five, not, not even for the next three years. By 2025, they want to train 300,000 of their frontline workers in skills of the future, right? So there are mega opportunities in ed tech space also broadly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's the, in terms of receiving uh, venture investments or uh, just, just growth, uh, uh, billions of dollars have gone into it. There, there are multiple um, unicorns found in the space. And so as far as, uh, you know, um, EdTech gives us, and by the way, just to, just to be clear, we're unapologetically commercial. Uh, you know, we believe that to actually scale any impact, you have to be profitable first. And so we're double bottom line business. Uh, you know, we're, we're growing rapidly. We're growing uh, our revenues, uh, you know, uh, 
Uh, this year we expect uh, 20 million plus in ARR, which is double of what we made last year, and the trajectory is, is going to accelerate. Our headcount has been accelerating, so big opportunities, as I said. Uh, 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 playing at the intersection of these three mega trends, uh, you know, we're, we're building a category defining business uh, that's helping solve some of the most difficult social and uh, um, um, uh, business problems today. Wow, this is very, very cool. I'm really glad I met you that day at the coffee <laughs> shop. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, let others chime in and ask questions. Oh, my goodness. All right, I'm coming. It's way up on the other side of the room. I'm going to get my steps in. <laughs> so, pardon, <laughs> pardon me. I'm glad I wore sensible shoes. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so I've largely been in diversity and inclusion. I was on the diversity and inclusion team at Facebook. I did a lot oh. of the like focus group findings that you um, talked about. But I'm very curious, you know, you yourself as a, um, as a leader have uncovered data around diversity and inclusion. What are you implementing within your organization that potential organizations can model um, as they build out their companies as well? Absolutely, great question. So one of the things we do is um, we train thousands of people, uh, women, underrepresented minorities, in data science uh, and other data analytics, other adjacent skills for free. Now, what we do is, uh, you know, again, this is sort of, uh, uh, we, we found a model where firms basically, you know, uh, come to us, they use this, the, uh, the platform that we created to upskill their own talent. But when it comes to our own company, you know, uh, uh, it, few things, uh, when it comes to technical roles, right? So th there is a war for talent, right? So we're, we're in the space. We're fortunate to receive, um, uh, have frontline access to that pipeline. So um, the guidance to all the hiring managers at, at, at Coalition One, if there are two equally qualified candidates for a role and one of the candidates is a woman, she gets the job without any question. And uh, things like that. So I'll tell you, you know, about three years ago, Less than 10 percent. We were a typical tech company, you know, um, uh, l like predominantly male, and uh, we had less than 10 percent women in our company. Today, in, in under three years, there's over 40 percent women in our company. About 30 percent of our uh, employees come from historically underrepresented communities. So, uh, we, I'll say, we have an edge. We have an advantage because of the platform that we've created, we have access to a lot of pipeline, but you have to be intentional as a leader, right? This, is, this cannot be, uh, uh, you know, the number six priority on, on your list. This has to be uh, one of the top three, right? You have to care about bottom line, you have to care about customers, then you have to care about diversity. That's sort of, uh, those are the top three, no particular order. Hi. Um, so you were speaking about, you know, the women of color that do end up in these C-suite roles and they're alone. And it's taking a long time for us to catch up to them and for us to give them that support and the people that look like them. What do you think that they should be doing right now while they wait for that? Is it that they have to try and find allyship in those white male and female counterparts that are there? and maybe provide them education as well of why they need maybe even extra support from them? And if, if that is the answer, does your organization help with that education for those other counterparts that are yeah. you know not in the minority group and letting them know that they need to create that support for them? Excellent question. I'll answer it in two parts. Um, so, so part one, right? Uh, it, it, it goes back to, so one of the things we do, like we train thousands of people every year for free. Uh, now, every single person we train gets connected to a mentor. The mentors don't have to come from uh, underrepresented backgrounds. In fact, we give this, like, just, just in 2021, we had over uh, 800 mentors 
these are senior leaders of like data science and technology teams who commit um, up to uh, two hours a week on mentoring uh, the program graduates. Like, so 95% of our class is black or Hispanic, right? So um, what we're doing right now is creating that platform to, to connect mentors to, uh, to talent. And it's just been one of the most gratifying things I've done uh, my entire life because people want to help, people want to support. There's, there's a lot of intention. They're just looking for good solutions to, um, to bring their skills to, to the table, right? So- Tom, uh, can you give us an example of a student that you, you know, one of the people that you trained for free and then an example of a mentor? Absolutely. Um, so give you an example, like uh, this is, uh, again, there, there are dozens of stories like, but um, um, we have, just to, just to uh, uh, make this point, we, we had, we had, we had um, a student, uh, she was an immigrant from Nigeria, came to, came to, uh, came to the US about seven, seven or eight years ago. Now, um, she was working as a massage therapist she never had the opportunity to actually go and uh, learn the skills. She was very, very smart. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, what people lack are access to opportunities. So she applied for the program. She was just like smart, like everyone who applies for the program actually goes and takes an assessment where we assess people for foundational skills. Uh, we don't assess them for uh, 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 foundational understanding of some core principles that we're trying to teach. We don't assess them for skills. Uh, she did well, got into the program. 13 weeks later, she was hired as a technology analyst at Accenture. From being a massage therapist, she never thought that these doors existed for her, right? This is, this is the power of mentorship, right? So it's not just the skills. You can't just teach skills and expect people to, uh, you know, find a job or be on their own. Uh, you know, we, we focus a lot on the last mile problem. What happens after we give you the skills, right? You need career co success coaches. We have, uh, we have entire teams, all they're focused on our job prep. Right, interview prep. These are these are things we take for granted uh, when we're attending CBS. But when you come from historically underrepresented communities, you just don't have access. And so that's that's one concrete example. Um, and me. sorry, Tim, uh, we have about three minutes left. Okay, awesome. Uh, and the other, in terms of like um, what we need to do, right now, uh, we. Our strategy, what we've been working with some of the largest enterprises in the world is we want to dramatically increase the entry level pipeline of women of color, women in general, in uh, what we call the job families of the future, right? Uh, like from 17, this should be on par today, right? Like we should be aiming for 50%, right? Because no matter what, you know, those, those numbers will decline as people progress. So the way to increase the representation at every level is to start the focus, keep the focus on entry level pipeline. Uh, we need to do uh, three, four X, right? So that's basically what um, uh, we're aiming to do. One of the uh, programs that we run, the programs, Correlation One runs a program called Data Science for All. As the name implies, is to broaden access uh, but the strategy is focus on entry-level pipeline. We need to do it three times better. Great. So it's um, time. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a really, really oh. quick question? Sure, sure. Go, go for it. Go ahead. Um, I grew up in New York City. I went to public school here. I attended a little program called Math for Girls while I went yep. to public school here, actually a couple blocks away. Um, are you targeting, you said you're targeting, you know, youth pipeline from, uh, sorry, you said talent pipeline from a younger age. Are you targeting communities like Harlem that you mentioned that kind of moved you to even start this company? Yeah, we focus, uh, our programs are national, but to be eligible for one of our training programs, by the way, we, tra we trained about uh, 2,500 people last year. Uh, you have to belong to an underrepresented minority community or women to be even eligible. So it's national, uh, clearly, you know, uh, uh, Harlem is obviously, you know, at our, in our backyard. 
but uh, we have national partnerships with historically black community uh, colleges and universities, National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Professional Hispanic Engineers, national level networks uh, to, to develop the town. So that's basically uh, national focus. for having us today or for speaking to us today. That is the, gonna be the conclusion of our sessions for the day. Um, thank you for everyone for coming to the fifth annual Women Business and Leadership Tech Conference. I would like to also thank uh, Vista Equity Partners for their sponsorship of this event and for their support of the CBS community. Um, I would invite everyone to join us upstairs for a grab and go lunch and uh, thank you for um, joining us today. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.